We are so excited to delve into day two of breaking the chokehold of poverty. We pray that as you listened last night, that your spirit was enlivened to believe God for what he could do in and for and through you and your entire bloodline. Tonight, we are pleased to introduce Apostle Ryan Lestrange as our first session. Let's listen in. Hey, everybody, I'm Ryan Lestrange, and I'm excited to be a part of this conference, this online educational platform, Breaking the Chokehold of Poverty. And I'm sure the other speakers are going to speak about this in a, in a multiplicity of ways. And I sort of struggled with what part of this should I tackle? And I want to speak on this subject of streams and entrepreneurship because I think that a lot of times we can get stirred to prosper. We can dig into the Word of God and we can begin to find out what the Bible says about provision and prosperity and we get excited and when we get excited then we want to immediately jump into it. But I feel like sometimes we need to bring together the supernatural and the practical and I'm going to attempt to do that in my session. So I want to go all the way back to the garden because I think one of the controversies is well, was it or is it God's plan to prosper people? Because we've got religious leaders and religious people, especially in the Western church world, saying prosperity is demonic. And so I, I love what a Christian business person that I know said. They said, you know, a lot of times they see business people saying, well, we're in business to help people. We're in business to uh, create the best this or the best that. And my friend said, uh, he said, I don't like that because really we're in business to make money. Uh, that's the, the purpose of business and economy. And I believe in the time you and I are living in, in this, this age, there are two things happening uh, at the same time. There's problems. You know, we've seen a reformation in the jobs market like never before. And we've seen uh, trends change. And we've seen industries that were relevant and positions that were relevant for generations suddenly dry up. And of course, throughout human history, we've seen this anytime there's innovation. Uh, but at the same time, I believe we're living in a time of unprecedented opportunity. People who are already working in a job can easily get, diversify their income stream. And so a lot of times the big mistake in the area of prosperity is we look for harvest just on one front. I think uh, in my own experience, being a part of the Word of Faith movement and learning faith to prosper and faith to sow and faith to tithe and faith to believe God. Sometimes I saw people whose uh, primary uh, calling was big business and they would hear the preacher preach and they would hear the preacher say somebody walked up to me in a service and gave me a ten thousand dollar check and then they would begin to feel like wait a minute nobody's ever walked up and given me a ten thousand dollar check but if their main calling was in the marketplace then their harvest field was in the marketplace and so I think sometimes we didn't understand that the harvest field of the preacher was there in the church but the harvest field of many other people's in the marketplace so let's go back to the very beginning how how did this thing work in the beginning? I'm glad you asked. Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to thy sight and good for food. So we see food which speaks of provision, the tree of life, and the midst of the garden, the knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. So God had a system a provision for them. Watch this now. A river went out to water the garden and parted. It became four heads. The name of the first is Pison, which compasseth the land of Hevila, where there's gold, and the gold of that land is good. I want to stop and say all that. The Bible said the gold of that land is good. So in the beginning, God created a place of abundance for Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve did not wake up in the morning and struggle with how are we going to get money? How are we going to pay for our bills? They didn't have bills. How are we going to get food? God created a garden where there was food. You don't see stress and toil and labor for provision until after the fall of man. So the original job description of man was to move in the kingdom to walk with God and provision was attached to relationship and I want to submit this thought to you I'm not teaching on tithing and giving in this session I'm teaching on streams and entrepreneurship but I want to relate this thought to you I believe that where we miss it in the area of the tithe and in the offering is we make it a, a thing of works people say well if I don't tithe am I cursed and you know if I made $1,122.15 do 
Do I need to get that thing exactly right? And I believe they become legalists in an area where God's calling them to be relational. It's about relationship. And so the Bible said that from this garden, there was a river that parted in four heads. There's prophetic implication. I'll break down. Uh, and he said that the first one is Pison, and it encompasses Havilah, and the gold of that land is good. Now, God didn't say the gold was demonic. This is something you need to understand, that God could have put Adam and Eve in an ugly space, in a space that didn't matter what it looked like, but God put them in a beautiful garden. He took care in furnishing that garden and creating it, that it was beautiful because God understood the power of environments. We read about heaven, that there are streets of gold. The environment is clean and it is prosperous. It is not dirty. It is not impoverished. Now, many people in, in humanity are struggling with that. And I believe as Christians, we are to be change agents, that we operate in a different system. So Python was the first one. And then the Bible said there was gold and the gold of the land was good. God said this, not me. There's Bedellum and Onyx stone. The second uh, name of the second river is Gihon. It comes about in the land of Ethiopia. The third river is Hittikel, which goes toward east of Assyria. And the fourth, Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the, into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So there were four rivers. Pison, which it means increase. There was a river of increase. Gihon, which means a bursting forth. Hittikel, which means rapid. Euphrates, which means fruitfulness. So these four different rivers were rivers of provision. Now, the average millionaire has multiple streams. I don't remember the exact count. I think it's something like seven different streams of income. And if you're going to move in prosperity... You're going to have to think multiple streams. Maybe you've got a nine to five and that nine to five uh, is helping you. It's paying your bills. But what other stream could open up? Can you invest in the stock market? Can you get uh, an interest bearing CD? Uh, you know, can you start some kind of, uh, of side online store? What, where, where can you create more streams? Because real prosperity is not just coming from one stream. There were four streams of increase, of abundance and provision. So I want you to set your faith today on multiple streams of income and revenue. Uh, let me talk about some practical ideas. I, uh, some years ago as a preacher, the Lord began to call me into real estate. And I remember battling with this thing because I knew so many preachers that felt like if you begin to get into business, you're backsliding and you know, you, you got to just preach and, uh, and, and they didn't understand what the power of being set free economically that God gives you other streams of income. And I began to read the Bible and study the Bible. And I found out something in the Bible. I found out that God never said, I'm going to make you a, a, a tenant. He said, I'm going to make you an owner. And I believe the spirit of dominion is the spirit of ownership. And so I began to, first of all, sell homes as a realtor bivocationally while pastoring a church. Uh, because I got this in my spirit. I got faith for land. And then I began to invest in properties. Then I began to flip properties. And then I got involved in something so fascinating, which was online, uh, the e-learning space in Christian circles and faith-based circles. And I began doing that in my ministry. And I said, wait a minute, there's an entire stream of revenue here that is outside of what I'm doing over here. So I created a for-profit company just to house that. And I was sitting with a multimillionaire who made their millions in the online world. And he said this to me, he said, Ryan, you've got to think of the online world as real estate. Now, I don't remember if he even knew my background of real estate, but he said, it is, it is digital real estate. And I want to say to you that I think one of the hot businesses today is digital real estate. There are so many things you can do online, literally from reselling things that you bought at estate sales and yard sales in an online market space to creating an ebook to creating e-courses. The e-learning space is now in the billions of dollars and predicted to only grow and grow and grow. And many of you will watch this and say, well, Ryan, I couldn't sell anything in e-learning. You'd be amazed. There are people getting married they don't know how to cook. And if you created an amazing, simple cooking class, there's somebody out there that wants that. There are wonderful parents that are going to watch this teaching, that you've learned skills to raising good children, to raising well-adjusted children, to raising emotionally and spiritually healthy children. That parents who are in the fight of their life raising children and feel overwhelmed and need help would love to purchase your e-course. There are pastors that are going to watch this, that you have developed some brilliant systems for your church. And there's a young church planter that is struggling with their new church plant that is desperately in need of wisdom. And they find your e-course online and say, I would love to be a part of that. So 
multiple streams of income. Let me give you some ideas. An online business, as I just described, is a wonderful idea for a secondary stream of income. One of the easiest ways to do this is to become an Amazon affiliate. Most of you are on Facebook, Instagram, somewhere in cyberspace, I assume, because this is an online event. Um, you can go and become an Amazon affiliate marketer. You find products you use, you like, and you just share them with other people. Now, you're probably not going to make seven figures doing that, but you're going to make something. What could you do with an extra $1,000 a month? What could you do with that? It may be a game changer for you. Um, there's a lot of network marketing businesses. I'm not in the network marketing space. For me, it's not one of my favorite things, but I'm amazed how many people really prosper and do well over there. I have people that I know that are making multiple six figures because they got passionate about a company that has a network marketing uh, platform that is changing people's lives. So that's another space, and that's a great secondary stream. You can sell something. You can create a product. Um, find a passion project. Maybe there's a passion project out there. What do you enjoy? What hobby do you love? Uh, do, you under, do you realize that, that people make big checks creating YouTube videos? I watched a lady the other day because during the pandemic, my wife and I began to do acrylic uh, pour painting just for fun and stress relief. And I was watching a lady the other day that, that was doing a pour painting video and I think had hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube. She got a check from that video. Maybe there's a passion project. Well, I love to fish. You'd be amazed how many people watch your fishing videos if you know what you're talking about. And, and you could just take that into any space. Maybe you're going to buy old furniture and refurbish it and turn around and sell it, but you love doing that. It's a passion project for you. I'm involved in several passion projects. I'm not doing them for what the bottom line paycheck is. I'm doing them because I love them. But the side benefit is it's another stream for me of revenue. Um, you know, maybe you're obsessed with homemade jewelry and, and Etsy is calling your name to share jewelry that you make. Maybe you just are, are well-versed on the Amazon reselling game and you need some extra cash. You can become an affiliate. Maybe you're absolutely consumed with a specific topic and you would be a great blogger that people would love to advertise on your blog to reach that niche of people. Uh, stock investment is a space that you could get involved in. Real estate is a space. Now, I want to give you a concept. Third John verse 2 said, Beloved, I wish above all things that I prosper and mean health even as thy soul prospers. One of the things I want you to understand is what economic freedom does, it buys you time. In our climate, in our culture, we trade time for money. I, I'm often amused when I ask people to provide a service for me. Recently, I was talking to somebody that does administration. I said, I need some help with some projects. And the first question they asked me was, how many hours will that be? Well, because our brains have been trained to formulate everything we do into time capsules. And I said to the person, the problem for me is I don't know how fast you work. What might take me five hours could take you 10. Or what might take me five hours could take you two. Vice versa. So we trade time for money. So when we gain access to more revenue, we create more time. I was reading the blog of a day trader who began to day trade and got quite wealthy. And his number one goal was, I want to, I want to enjoy my life. So from day trading, he got into the e-learning space and began to create these amazing courses and produce seven figures from courses teaching people how to day trade. But while he would go create these courses, he'd stay at these luxurious homes and everybody wanted to know, where are you at? And he would stay 30 days in another country just enjoying himself because the job he, he had, day trading and now e-learning, freed up his time to do what he loved to do, which was travel. Well, now he's open Airbnbs because so many people want to stay in the spaces he's been in. So he's creating these luxurious rentals, passion projects. Money releases time. And this is why I believe entrepreneurship can be such a key. So soul prosperity, when you do what you love, it'll translate into economic prosperity. I kind of have this little system that I'd like to throw out to you. Think of the word drip, D-R-I-P. If you're taking notes, write this down, drip. I want to give you four things that I believe are, are critical to entrepreneurship and streams. And let me say this, not everybody's going to be an entrepreneur, but this is such a time. There's so much happening in the labor field of the world and so many challenges that we faced recently and probably more challenges we're going to face. I think it's such a brilliant time to have some kind of footing in entrepreneurship, even if you're a nine to fiver. And not everybody's going to be an entrepreneur. They're not, not everyone's going to love that. So I realize some people are going to watch this teaching and say, this is not for me. That's okay. 
But for some of you, this is the light's going to come on because we're talking about breaking the chokehold of poverty. So I'm using the word drip. A D stands for diversify. R stands for reinvest. I stands for initiate. And P stands for plan. Let me just lead you through this thought I have. I want you to think about being intentional in diversifying your flow. When God created the garden, there were four rivers, not one. So we've been trained, go to school, learn a trade, trade time for the trade. If you do really well, you'll get some stock options, some retirement, and there you go. The problem with that is oftentimes by the time you have your leftover time, you're so depleted of energy and mental ability and clarity, you're absolutely exhausted. Now, I want to say this, entrepreneurship can be very similar. Sometimes, you know, it's that old thing. If you're passionate, I'll get you up early and keep you awake late at night. So I'm not trying to give you an easy out. I'm trying to show you a very biblical model that in the garden, man was prosperous. And one of the ways was there was multiple streams. So I want to get that concept for you to diversify, to be intentional about diversifying your flow. It's not easy. When I began to diversify my flow, it literally took me years to do it. So you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to try things. You're going to fall down. You're going to get back up. You're going to fall down. You're going to get back up. One piece of advice I would give you is to look for somebody that's already successful in the space you're going into. Buy their course. I have found out this. Free advice is usually worthless because most people willing to give free advice are not very successful in the thing of which they're giving advice on. That's free. <laughs> so there you go. Diversify. R, reinvest. Take a portion of the income you have coming in and reinvest it. So one way you can create another stream. Let's run through this. Let's say that I'm stewarding $65,000 a year and I'm, maybe I'm living in a place because it's not a lot of money. I'm in the Atlanta metro. Uh, that, that's a challenging income to, to live off. But let's say I'm in a place where maybe I can live well for $50,000 a year. Okay, so I'm, I'm making sixty-five. I'm, I'm tithing. There goes, what is that? You know, $6,500 right off the bat. So that leaves me with a little bit. Maybe I'm only taking $1,000 to $2,000 a year, but I'm reinvesting that in stocks, in interest-bearing bonds. Even if that's very small, I'm creating a trickle. And the trickle's going to grow as the investment grows. So I can literally create another stream of income that way. Maybe I'm going to a conference. You know, somebody told me recently, I'm thinking about taking this real estate course, but it's $2,000. They said, well, the teacher of the course, what have they done? They began to tell me, I said, if they teach you how to do a portion of that and you're diligent, it's worth $20,000. Most people are afraid of investment, but you're never going to break through a barrier or a level without investment. So reinvest, identify a portion of your income to reinvest, whether that's in learning, study, or literally reinvesting in projects, a new business, or something like that. Third thing, initiate, take small steps. So I think sometimes the big fear in stepping out is just you're seen all the way over here, but sometimes it's the small step. There's a step in front of you and you've got to take that. And then the P for plan. No plan is always gonna lead you to failure. So I meet people that say, God's calling me to be a millionaire. And I say, well, what financial books have you read? Zero. I'm just sewing. I'm glad you're sewing. I'm glad you're sewing. That's the beginning of the thing, right? But I wanna give you another thought. Sewing is not just putting your money in an offering plate or giving a cash app to a preacher. Sewing is also you investing in yourself because if I'm going to occupy a new space, I've gotta invest in myself. I had, uh, had six-figure launches online but still paid a coach earlier this year, the year that I'm filming this, to teach a new system because I wanted to do even better. And so reinvestment is so critical. And then to initiate, to, to take a small step. It might be, I'm just going to start this one little thing. Sometimes people are so overwhelmed by the big thing, but look at what is in front of you to do today. And then to plan. No plan will lead to failure, okay? Ecclesiastes 11. Ecclesiastes 11, verses one and two. Cast thy bread upon the water, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Then in verse six, in the morning sow thy seed, in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether thou shalt prosper either this or that, or whether they shall be alike good. So the principle here is you gotta cast your bread upon the waters. Anything I do is going to require seed. I'm gonna have to be willing to make an investment. So in the kingdom, this means following the word of God and being a giver. I think one of the tragedies is when people get involved in, in entrepreneurship and they're stingy. 
The reason God wants you to be a wealth creator, Deuteronomy 8, 18, said he gives you power to prosper, to establish his covenant on earth. He wants your life to be a witness so you can witness to other people about the goodness of God. I found religious people hate, hate teaching on prosperity and provision, and it's because their theology is that God is mad at them. I don't read that in the New Testament. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, I believe he literally meant it, that he paid the price and defeated death, hell, and the grave. So the gospel is good news. And part of the good news is that God is my provider as my father, as Abba, he's my provider. So one of the reasons why the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just is the just will invest wealth into good spaces and places. And I believe that's what Ecclesiastes is saying. Not only giving into the gospel, into good ministries, into places we're being fed, but also investing in our own growth. Also making sure I'm not just putting all my resources right here. You know, one of the things uh, that I said earlier about sort of our, our American and Western world mindset is our mindset go to school, get a great job, work really hard, and maybe retire good and live 10, 15, maybe 20 good years of life. That's kind of our mindset. But that is not the abundant life at all. And so many people fail to divide up their resources and invest in other things. Starting that second business or investing in the stock market or wherever you want to invest. A lot of people are doing cryptocurrency now. So wherever you want to invest, wherever the Lord leads you, needs to be an area that you're praying over, um, is casting your bread upon the waters. There's an investment there. And then... Let me just go and skip here and let me go down and give you some, some practicalities before I wrap this session. Deuteronomy 8, 18. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. It is he that gives the power to get wealth. Uh, I want you to think of the anointing to get wealth. God's super on your natural. That he may establish his covenant which he swear unto his fathers this day. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. Here's where I believe we as the church need to get more activated. We need to think about building creative and innovative enterprise. We think about the wealth of the wicked. And in our mind's eye, it's like some unsaved, ungodly person is going to pay off our church. And yes, and amen to that possibility. But I think what we don't think about is that kingdom people get activated. I'm not about tongue talking, fall out in the spirit preachers. I'm not about the lap cloth lady that puts the cloth over people when they fall out. I'm talking about the Sunday school teacher. The prophetic team leader, people active in the kingdom, that God would release strategies and wisdom and ideas that we would get involved in different spheres of society and we would become solutions because money is tied to solving problems. One of the things I think the church has really struggled with in this current season is that society has changed underneath our feet and skilled business people are analyzing the changes and say, how do I adapt my business to solve these problems? Why would I wait in a line in Chick-fil-A, if y'all are watching this from another country and you don't know what that is, fast food restaurant here, and wait in a long line of people to get through to get this chicken sandwich when I could go anywhere else? Well, number one, the quality of it, the taste of it, and they're saving me time. They're not necessarily ministering to my health, by the way, because it's not the best health choice, but they're saving me time, so in essence... They're solving me a problem. Why would I pay DoorDash extra money to deliver my favorite restaurant to my house? Because they just solved me a problem. They gave me back 30 minutes of my life to devote to something else. So I'll gladly pay that extra $5. Do you understand? So solutionists create and build innovative enterprise. I believe part of the apostolic and prophetic anointings is the pioneering anointing. Luke 1.17 uh, the prophets and the prophetic goes out ahead. We know that apostles and apostolic people are forerunner type people. When, when this begins to function in the marketplace, it's going to capture portions of the mind of God because prophecy and the prophetic anointing is the mind of God. Do you think there's anything less than wisdom in the mind of God? Absolutely not. So we capture the mind of God for investment and for growth, and then we build structures that are new and they're innovative. And it's those places of innovation that make a difference. You know, I was, I was reading recently about um, Tyler Perry. I live outside of Atlanta, and his studio now is one of the largest studios in America, and just amazing what he's done. But one of the things that he has done 
is he's created his own system of production where he produces about triple the amount of content that other producers produce in the same time frame that he produces in. And he's created a whole system to do that. And people have been very critical of what he's produced, but ultimately he's become a multi-billion dollar enterprise by innovating in content creation. I think this is what we've got to employ the mind of God in. And I see so many people that are just stuck because they don't want to get creative. Their concept is God's going to bless me somehow. I want you to understand as a wealth creator, as an innovator, which I think all of us have the potential to be on some level, on some level, you know, what your level is versus other person. I don't know, but God will define it for you. But being that innovator means daring to say, okay, God, what solution am I here to offer? What strategy do you want to release to me? It could be as simple as you creating a course that changes people's lives. It could be as simple as you making it fun for me to see what thing you're buying on Amazon and you're on Instagram creating little stories. I'm saying, you know what, Kelly, she just bought that, that, dish, that rack for your dishes and I, I want to try that. It could be that simple. It could be as profound as you creating an entirely new way of doing something but we have to take the limits off God. Many of us are praying for resources. We're praying for economy. And God answers that prayer with an idea that needs to be nurtured. That's the seed, nurtured and developed. Let me leave you with this. In the kingdom of God, the progression is always seed, then blade, then fruit. That thing could fail at the seed stage if it's not planted, recognized, nurtured. When you put a seed in the ground, you gotta water it, pull the weeds up. Then at the blade stage, that's when the thing first pushes up. If you don't tend to that, that will, that will die before it ever gets to the fruit stage. We look at the fruit stage. I want that seven-figure breakthrough. I want to, maybe, maybe for some of you, you're like, Ryan, I just want a six-figure breakthrough. I just, $20,000 a year could change my life. I was having a meeting with someone recently, and I said, what's the number that would be a game changer for you? And it's amazing. Some people just having one more stream of income that brought in $10,000 a month could be a game changer. I was talking to a person who does some work for me online and they said, this, this person I know released a, an e-course that in 30 minutes brought in six figures. This was in the faith-based arena. Could you imagine if God dropped that into you? What well, happens first by prayer, then discerning it's the will of God for your life and then putting feet to faith, studying, researching, investing in yourself. And believing God, hey, in the beginning, you had multiple streams. I'm going to believe God for my life to have multiple streams. Let me pray with you. Uh, and I just believe, God, that this breaking and chokehold of poverty uh, course is just going to be amazing for you. So, Father, I thank you right now. Father, I thank you for strategies, solutions, wisdom, ideas, witty inventions in Jesus' name that you just begin to bring it alive in your people. I thank you for the anointing, for prosperity, for the Deuteronomy 818 anointing working in their life. And I bless them today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, it's an honor to be able to give my contribution to this series on breaking the chokehold of poverty. I think it was several months ago, the Lord woke me up at three in the morning and kept saying that phrase to me over and over and over again, and I couldn't get away from it. And so I believe that this is right on time and that God has something powerful for us to receive in this. And when we think of the word poverty, I'm sure that there's a lot of images from many different perspectives that fill your mind. It's not a nice word. It doesn't have a nice connotation. It's one of hunger and thirst, lack and need, rejection and abandonment even, social stigmas. Poverty is the reality of many people around the world. It is the chokehold on their life that cuts them off from opportunity, advancement, and all kinds of things, and even in some cases, their hope for the future. Several people have been quoted as saying that poverty is the worst form of violence that there is. That's a deep statement when you consider all of the implications of that statement. Because poverty, it's not just an economic reality, it's also a social reality. It can become a mindset, an expectation, a way of life even for people who are cyclically caught in it. Poverty is defined as this, the state of being extremely poor, 
the state of being inferior in quality or insufficient in amount, the renunciation of the right to individual ownership or property as part of religious vow. Around the world, there are an estimated 780 million people that live in extreme or what they call absolute poverty. These people live on less than a dollar and 90 cents U.S. dollars per day, and that is below what is thought to be sustainable on almost any location on this entire globe. Undernutrition is caused by this lack of financial resource, and there's an estimated 45% or almost half of all of the deaths related to poverty in children, specifically in children, is because of this lack of resource financially and undernutrition. As of 2019, an estimated 10.5% of Americans live in one state or in one level of poverty, we are considered to be one of the most or the most wealthy nations in the world. But consider that over 10% of Americans in 2019, that's pre-pandemic. I'm sure that it's even worse now after we've gone through the COVID pandemic. And it's said that there will be a sharp rise in poverty in the United States over the next 50 years. So when we think of this concept, it's something that from a natural perspective is not going away. And I believe that God wants to raise up kingdom people who have kingdom resources and kingdom answers to this global epidemic of poverty that really is driven by a curse and by a spirit. To, si to simply put it, the Bible defines poverty in a broad sense as a curse. In Deuteronomy 28, it talks about how our obedience to God and God's words brings upon us blessings that not only are there for us, but the Bible says they literally overtake us and come upon us. These blessings include being blessed in the city, in the country, the blessing of the fruit of our body, of our ground, of our basket, when we come in, when we go out, deliverance from our enemies and much, much more. Conversely, there are curses that are attached to disobedience. These curses mirror and are the opposite of the blessings of the Lord that are described in Deuteronomy 28, and they most accurately define how we would understand poverty. It speaks of those who disobey the word and the ways of the Lord being consumed and overtaken by all manner of manifestations of curses, as in verse 48, the reality of the utter poverty of these curses is brought home in these words. Verse 48 of Deuteronomy 28. Therefore you shall serve your enemies. So there, there's slavery, there's bondage. You shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. In need of everything. Now talk about poverty and the exact definition of poverty. It goes on to say this, and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until your enemy has destroyed you. And so poverty in all of its various manifestations, not the people who suffer from it, but poverty in all of its manifestations, the Bible defines it as a result of not being connected to the word and ways of God and not being connected to obedience to the Lord and that this curse of poverty comes in that. This curse curse of poverty is connected to bondage and slavery, constantly being overcome, plundered, beaten down, and conquered. These curses were connected to breaking the law, and the Bible says they were immutable. Now, the good news here is that the law was and is perfect, according to Psalm 19 and verse 7, and this could not be changed. It could not be altered until Christ came and set us free from the curse of the law, and I want you to hear this. I know many of us know this, and it seems basic to us. If it seems basic to you, hear it again. But there are many of us who are watching today that you need to hear this. Christ Jesus has set you free from the curse of the law, and therefore he has set you free from the curse of poverty. Romans 8, 3 and 4 says this, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Furthermore, Galatians 3 and 13 says this, but Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse of our wrongdoing. For in the scriptures it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So Christ Jesus became a curse for us in the most literal sense. He was the 
snake, where it says in the, in the Old Testament that uh, the snake was lifted up in the desert, and that literally that snake, anyone who looked upon the snake was healed of all the snake bites. Jesus became a curse, a snake being significant of a curse, and he was lifted up, just like Moses, lifted up that thing on a rod or on a pole, and anyone who looked upon that was healed. Jesus became a curse for us so that we could be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so you are set free because of the power of the blood of Jesus from every single curse, and that includes the curse of poverty and the curse of the perfection of the law that none of us could fulfill in and of ourselves. So if that is the truth, why do so many Christians still struggle in patterns of poverty over and over and over again? It seems like you're just about to get a breakthrough and something pulls you back into those same old patterns that you were in. Something pulls you back into lack. Something pulls you back into doubt. Something pulls you back into unbelief, into need, into not having enough. When the scripture tells us that we are to have an abundance in Christ Jesus, and Deuteronomy 28 clearly says that to us. So why do so many Christians suffer from this if it's true that the word of God, through the power of the blood of Jesus, has set us free from every curse? Doesn't the word of God always work? Yes, indeed, absolutely, the word of God always does. However, I believe that the word needs to be both applied and believed in the truest sense that Jesus meant it in John 8 and 32 when he said this, that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And you can be saying, now listen, I know the truth. I know the scriptures. Why am I not free? The Bible says I'm free. I believe the scripture. I know it. But there's a mystery and there's a clue that is hidden in this that is really a key of breakthrough for us. The word know in the Greek in that uh, passage of scripture in John 8, 32 is the word ginosko. Gnosko. And gnosko means this. It means to know by encounter, to know by experience. It's not enough just to know by intellectual knowledge. It's not enough just to read your Bible and name it and claim it. It's not enough. You've got to encounter the Word of God and the truth of God washing over your life and setting you free from cyclical patterns of poverty that for many of us, they have come down through the generations over life after life year after year, generation after generation. It's not enough just to have intellectual knowledge. God wants to break the curses of generations off of our lives, that legally they are broken because of the blood of Jesus, but experientially we've got to be sanctified in those areas of our soul that carry the iniquity of our ancestors and those that have gone on before us. As believers, we are to go from strength to strength, from faith to faith, and from glory to glory. And there is to be a continual process of sanctifications in and through and for our lives where literally the patterns and the strongholds of the iniquity of all of our ancestors are broken as our life becomes experientially, remember that word gnosko, experientially free as we walk in faith and from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from glory to glory. Philippians 2 and 12 says this, that we are to continually work out our salvation through fear and trembling. The word there for salvation is the word soteria, soteria, and it literally means deliverance, It means welfare, prosperity, preservation, salvation, and safety. So we are to work out continually our deliverance. As believers, yes, in our spirit, 100%, when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that he is the Christ, the Son of God, then our spirit is regenerated. There's a whole theology behind that. We are regenerated through and through, but in our soul and in this physical life that we walk in, in as a as a person, as a human being on planet earth, we are to be sanctified. And in that process of sanctification, our deliverance is absolutely a continual thing that we go from strength to strength, from faith to faith, and from glory to glory. And so in this process, let me encourage you, if you are not all the way free yet, there is hope for you because God is taking you through a process. And there is key after key that is going to be illuminated and revealed to you. There is glory upon glory that is going to be illuminated and revealed to you 
you and your process of deliverance is not cut short just because you don't see the full manifestation. Keep going, keep persevering because your deliverance is drawing nigh. And I'm gonna give you some keys to that. And the first key in that is expectation. Expectation. Everything in our life in God, everything in our walk with Christ is about faith. And when it comes to breaking free of a pattern of poverty, many times it is linked to our expectation, which is ultimately an issue of faith. Because poverty is often cyclical. It often has a pattern to it. Many times our expectation becomes, when we are in those cycles of poverty, that when one bad thing happens, another bad thing is going to happen. And then when that happens, another bad thing is going to happen. Many of you have felt that. Many of you have even experienced that in your lives. It's like when it rains, it pours. It's like a domino effect that when one bad thing happens or one bad news comes your way, one big bill that you weren't expecting comes your way, what little progress that you had made, you just get slapped back into, you know, square one almost because you feel like this thing never will let you go. Well, I want to tell you, some of that can be linked to an issue of faith and to your expectation of who you believe that God is to be in your life. Let me tell you this, God is good. This is a simple but yet such a profound truth that God is good and he has good plans for your life. If you have been in a pattern of poverty, if you have been in a pattern of lack, if you've been in a pattern of need and your expectation is to continue to go through that over and over and over again, you finally throw up your hands and you say, you know, listen, there's nothing that's ever gonna change in this. I'll always be in this place. I wanna encourage you, brothers and sisters, that is not the truth. There is a father who loves you and he has good things planned for you and you can and you will break through. And I speak to your spirit even now, and I say, let your expectation rise. Let your faith rise in the glory and in the anointing of God. As God has brought you to this place where you are watching this broadcast, wherever you are, and whatever state you're in in the United States, and whatever nation you're in around the world, you have come to this moment in your life for such a time as this, and God is about to break through in your life in a profound way as your expectation expectation rises and as your faith is restored because listen to this you have a good good father in exodus 33 when moses asked to see the glory of god what did god say he said i will cause all of my goodness to pass before you. The way that God revealed his glory to Moses, who the Bible says was faithful in all the house of God, the way that God revealed his glory to Moses was to reveal his goodness to Moses. And so God's character, God's nature, linked to your expectation of who you believe him to be has to be settled in you that he is good, and he is good all the time, not just for others, but for you. I'll never forget being in New York City, and specifically the Bronx, New York City. There's a lot of witchcraft and occult that that, uh, goes on in the Bronx. There's some amazing Christians and amazing people who break through that on a continual basis there. But there was this man there who used to be a warlock, and he said, I want to tell you the truth. We used to go to churches. We would sit there in the back, and we would place hexes and vexes and curses and all of this. And he said, one of the main curses that we would put on people is that they could believe or that they would believe that God would do something for somebody else and not for them. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, if you believe that God is good to the person sitting next to you or the person, uh, you know, in the home next to you or in your church or wherever you are, to one of your friends, one of your neighbors, that God is good to them and not to you, you are under a curse. And it's a curse of expectation. And it's linked to a distorted or a twisted view of who God God really, truly is. I break that curse off of your life right now in Jesus' name. Let your expectation begin to rise that God is good and he wants to be good to you. If you have an expectation of his goodness that surrounds your life, this mindset that is linked to expectation that God desires you to prosper will become a breaker key for your life for shattering poverty. Matthew 7, 9 to 11 says this, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone. 
Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We need to know the heart of the Father, that he desires to give good gifts to his children. We also need to know the heart and character and nature of the Father so we don't have an expectation of fear. Remember the parable of the talents. What did the man with the one talent say when the master came back? He said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, gathering where you had not sown and reaping where you had not planted. And so I hid my talent in the ground. What did he do? He was in poverty. That man with the one talent, he was in a poverty mindset. He wasn't in the mindset of multiplication that the master expected and desired of everybody who he had entrusted a portion of his wealth to. God has entrusted you a portion of his wealth. What are you doing with that? Is your expectation of the character and nature of the father that he's a hard man? Maybe that's what you've experienced in life, but I'm telling you, if that is your expectation, then you will not be a faithful steward and you are operating in a spirit of poverty. Break that right now in the name of Jesus. Let your expectation rise because God is a good God and he wants to be good to you and he wants to multiply in your life what you have and cause it to grow and expand and and literally be in a part of that dominion mandate even in the beginning in Genesis where God said fill the earth subdue it have dominion be fruitful and multiply the the principles of the kingdom are principles of multiplication and you can multiply as you break that expectation that the father is not for you and you receive the truth that he is for you and he wants to multiply in your life the second key i'm going to give you as i close is this obedience obedience. Every breakthrough that I have seen in my life has been in response to obedience. I'll never forget being with a ministry called Eagle's Wings, and they were sending a team to Israel. My almost or soon-to-be fiance was chosen to be a part of that team. At the same time that they were choosing that team to send them for is- to Israel for three months not one week, two weeks, three weeks, three months to send them to Israel. We were just about to get engaged. I had saved money to buy an engagement ring and all of that. At the same time that that was happening, they were raising money for something called the Jerusalem Prayer Banquet, and they were looking for sponsors to help to fund that important vital ministry that they were doing. On the same day that I found out that my almost fiance or soon-to-be fiance was to go to Israel for three months and we had to put off our engagement and all of that, the Lord spoke spoke to me and said, I want you to sow $2,500 and be a sponsor of this Jerusalem prayer banquet. Now, $2,500 for a person like me who is living as a missionary, not making a salary, not making a regular, um, you know, like I said, salary. We were just completely living on support and raising our support. $2,500 to save and put aside when you're meeting expenses, barely meeting expenses some months, maybe some months having a little bit more. That was all I had. And that was literally uh, a portion for my wife's engagement ring, my now wife's engagement ring, and all of that. So on the same day I found out that she was going to be going to Israel, the Lord spoke to me that same word and told me to give that money that I had saved for her into his purposes for Israel. And I said, God, why are you doing this? Why are you asking me of this? This is too much. This is harsh. God said this to me, as you build my house, I will build your house. As you are obedient to me, you will see my abundance. As you build my house, I will build your house. And as you are obedient to me, you will see my abundance. I sowed that seed. My wife and I now sowed that time, put off our engagement. When she came back, it was like the heavens literally opened up over us financially, even as missionaries, not even receiving a salary. We had more than enough. We had multiplication of the little bit that we had, and we saw the abundance of God, and we've seen that abundance of God throughout our entire marriage and our entire time together, and it is all linked to obedience. Sometimes we we believe that we've got to have a formula for breaking these things. I'm giving you keys, but I'm not giving you a formula. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So God will give you maybe some of these keys, maybe something he's speaking to you even now by his Spirit. But you will break through, not by a formula, but by following and obeying the Spirit of God. Uh, Samuel the prophet said this, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience to the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey 
obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. And so these two keys for you, let your expectation rise as you break and shatter the spirit of poverty over your life, that God is a good father, and what he has done for others, he will do for you. And then as he speaks, and as your expectation connects to his goodness, and as he releases his voice to you out of his goodness and his glory, obey what the word of the Lord says to you, and you will see the chokehold of poverty broken off of your life as you move into the abundance that is available to you in the kingdom of God. God bless you. We hope you're enjoying breaking the chokehold of poverty. We pray that faith is rising in your heart right now. There is nothing God cannot do in your life. Would you consider partnering with us to sow a seed into this Breaking the Chokehold of Poverty web event. You can click the link that's on this broadcast right now, or you can go to the Shekinah Church app, or you can go to the Shekinah Church website. Make sure that as you sow a seed into this Breaking the Chokehold of Poverty event, that you put that in the memo and you put Breaking the Chokehold of Poverty. We believe it's a privilege to sow into the kingdom and as you sow, that God will bring about a harvest in your life. God bless you. Now let's receive from Barbara J. Yoder, overseeing apostle of Shekinah Church in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as she wraps this up and brings it all together in such a powerful way. Wow, do you know that God wants us to prosper in all things? We're doing this series on breaking the chokehold of poverty, and it's really a multifaceted subject. And as I was uh, pondering what my part would be to bring everything together, the Lord gave me uh, in the morning 3 John verse 2 where it says, I pray, I'm going to read it specifically, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And that's a powerful scripture. And as we look at that scripture, we see that poverty doesn't just include wealth, it just doesn't include flourishing uh, in and of itself, but it has a multifaceted dimension. It affects um, uh, our health, it affects, uh, it's brought on by a spirit of religion. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But I wanna just break this down a little bit. It's a, it's a very exciting topic for me because God has challenged me all my life to have a generous spirit. And a generous spirit is a prosperous spirit. And a prosperous spirit brings about health in every bit of our being. And uh, it says, I pray that you, that word you in 3 John 2 is not just you, but your whole house. Those of us who have families, that as I prosper, my family's going to prosper. As you prosper, your family's going to prosper. So I pray that not only you, but your whole family prosper, your whole house prosper. Uh, if, I, if you lead a church, if you lead a ministry, that, that's, that's a type of house. So I pray that it would prosper. That word prosper means to flourish. It means to be filled with light. Uh, it's, it's, it's life-giving. It says that the first Adam was a living being, but the second Adam, Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God, is our life-giving spirit. And so everything about God and the Word of God is life. I want to say that again. It's life. And that word prosper is fascinating to me because it not only means to flourish or to be filled with life, it means uh, that you you will get help on the road that as that that John is praying that as we move forward that there's help on the way help on the road it also means success in reaching that we become prosperous when we reach the goals when we reach the destiny when we reach the mandates that God has given us when we fulfill what he's given us to do uh, in not 
not only in our entire life, but in every aspect of our life, that this word uh, uh, prosper means to succeed in reaching every part of what God has before us in every part of our life. It also means to succeed in business affairs. I love that for businessmen that and business women that that they will prosper, that they will succeed in all their business affairs. But then I have business affairs. You have business affairs, even if you're not an entrepreneur. And one of the meanings of that, biblically in the Greek, is to succeed in your business affairs. And then it says, I pray that you would prosper and be in health. That word health, what is that? It means to have sound health. What's that linked to? That's linked to infirmity, the negative side of it. The positive side is to be in health. The negative side is to be uh, to have infirmity. So it's sound health. It's to be physically well. Uh, it also has the implication of being safe. We're in a world today that's racked by a lack, lack of safety, that uh, there's hardly any place that feels secure anymore. We've just had multiple crises around the world with Afghanistan uh, being taken over by the Taliban, with the Haiti earthquake, uh, all the nations that aren't even in the news that are being racked by COVID, India, South Africa, uh, the Philippines, Indonesia. We know about the United States. We know about Canada. But there's nations that it's literally wreaked havoc. And even in Afghanistan, where there's all the problems in Haiti, they're not only dealing with the taking over the Taliban, fleeing the country or fleeing where the Taliban is, but they're having to deal with COVID in the process. And the same in Haiti. So we're living in a world that is very dangerous. Is it possible? to be secured in a dangerous world? Is it possible to be secured, to flourish in a world that doesn't feel safe anymore? It also means to be sound. Uh, you can apply that to doctrine, to have healthy doctrine, to be sound of mind, sound in your body, sound in your relationships, that to, to prosper affects and to be in health affects all these different areas. It means to be whole. Uh, I, I love that word, whole. I also, the word that's attached to it, I love that word, it's to be wholesome. When I think about my grandchildren, I think about what's wholesome for them. In other words, what, what feeds them in spirit, soul, and body that causes them to be enlarged, that causes them to feel like I did when I was a little child, to be excited, to look forward to getting up every morning, to smell the flowers, to hear the birds, to see the blue sky, to feel to, to that feel of jumping in the water in the lake and swimming as a, as a young child, learning how to swim at the age of four, that those are wholesome things, family activities, uh, wholesome uh, families, families that are positive, families that are healthy, families that are not dysfunctional. This is what the Apostle Paul was talking about in 3 John verse 2. And then he says, according to or just as when or how our soul prospers. Uh, there's many definitions for soul that I, I'll never forget reading Watchman Nee's book where he broke down the soul and he talked about the soul being the mind, the intellect, and the emotions. And it, it means more than that in the Greek, but... Uh, but depending on how our souls prosper, everything else hinges on the prospering of our souls. Our, our soul are, is our emotions, our will, and our intellect. 
And, and in, the, in the Greek, it's, it's fascinating. I had to look it up. I just wanted to be reminded of how the Greek defined it in this passage. And it's so powerful because it links to what God is saying for this decade. And the word soul there in 3 John 2 is the word suke in the Greek. Uh, P-S-U-C-H-E, pronounced suke. And suke is, is our breath. And breath is linked with the word pay. It's, it's our spirit. It's um, our heart. Uh, our heart, Paul said, guard your heart with all diligence because our heart also defines our emotions. It defines our will. It helps us become positive and move forward in each of these areas. Uh, the soul, as our soul prospers, that's life itself. And so as our life prospers, and then, and then of course I said earlier, our mind. And so as I, as I ponder on that passage, that it, I'm gonna focus on the word prospering in our soul because prospering in our soul causes us to prosper in every other area. What are we talking about? We're talking about the, the overall title of all of this is breaking the chokehold of poverty. This year, I believe it was Chuck Pierce gave the word that there's three things that God wants to break in us this year. One is the spirit of poverty. The other is the spirit of infirmity. And the third is the spirit of religion. I look at the spirit of religion different than a religious spirit. And if we're prospering, none of those three can prosper. But you and I do not have to be beggars. We can move in a spirit of faith because our souls are prospering in, in, in God. It's, it's connected to, the, the word poverty is connected with a defect. We can have a defect in our faith. We can have a defect in relationships. We can have shortcomings. It's also uh, one of the words that Webster's gave was the word shortcoming uh, uh, or debility. It also, I thought this was fascinating that it said to be, uh, to be in poverty was to be infertile. That when we have a spirit of poverty, we can't produce, we can't multiply. We, we, can't, um, we can't cause greater things to happen because we have poverty. We have a poverty spirit, and a poverty spirit causes us to be infertile or to, to be people of infertility. Poverty spirit don't Poverty spirit ridden people don't multiply themselves. Well, they do, but they multiply themselves negatively. But in God, it says, in Him we live and move and have our being. And God is a reproducing God. He said to Abraham, He said, I want to multiply you as the sands of the sea, as the stars of the sky. That, that was in the very beginning in the book of Genesis. God's heart is for multiplication positive multiplication, not poverty, not infertility, but multiplication, multiplying ourselves, multiplying our ministries, multiplying our families, multiplying health, multiplying wholesomeness, multiplying wellness, multiplying wealth. I, I do believe that God does have a heart for wealth. And some of the uh, 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 let me just say this, that, that one other thing that's related to poverty is, is the lack of something uh, that maybe you may not be lacking in some of the ways that I mentioned, but you're lacking something and you feel that lack. And so what we've got to do in order to begin to prosper is to attend to our soul. I was reading something recently 
that was, uh, I, th I think it was actually a video by Denzel Washington. And Denzel Washington is a believer. And he said, and he was taking this from a study that was done, he said they've shown that there's four markers for people that are successful in this world. And this was not just what he said, but he was, he was relating something that they found are the four markers for success. This isn't necessarily spiritual, but it is in the sense of, I believe this is the heart of God. He said, number one, finish high school. They've shown that people who uh, have these four qualities are the are the, they're the four markers of success to finish high school, to get a job, to get married, and to not have children before you get married. And that causes us to prosper in every area. I believe that God does want us to prosper in, in, in every area. And, and not just not just financially, but I believe he wants us to, to prosper financially too. Um, but if we have a poverty-ridden soul, if, if we're beggars, if we feel like everything's scarce, if we're destitute of soul, destitute of heart, if we have no hope for the future, then we've got a poverty spirit. And if we have a poverty spirit, we're going to be, uh, we're, we're going to be uh, targets of infirmities, physical sicknesses and diseases. We're also going to be victims of religion, plus religion, the spirit of religion. I'm not talking about a relationship with Christ, but religion will bring us into poverty because religion says you've got to do these things to prosper or not just to, but not really to prosper but to be good it's not about prospering it's not about being rich in spirit rich in soul it's about just making it in life obeying the rules obeying the regulations it, it, that's what we're dealing with with the Taliban look at what's happening they're they're taking away the lives of those that have begun to prosper in Afghanistan. Look at Haiti, that by and large is a nation that mixes Catholicism with voodoo, but really uh, is riddled with voodoo. It's a poverty ridden religion because they don't worship Jesus Christ, the living God. They don't have a vibrant relationship, but they, they are destitute because they're following a spirit of religion. And so, so the, the, the three are linked together. They've shown that all kinds of diseases are linked with poverty of spirit, poverty of soul. So this scripture is so key that I pray that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prosper, even as your intellect prospers, even as your will prospers, even as your emotions prosper. You know, uh, recently, uh, well, let me just say a couple of things. First, I, I believe it's related. The scripture talks about that we move from faith to faith. That is your faith growing. We can be overcome right now. I, I was thinking this morning, I made a note on Facebook that it's so easy to be overcome by all the devastation and all the pain in the world right now. That we in America, we've been uh, complaining about our situation, looking at the negative things. But look at some of these other nations. Uh, Indonesia, Iraq by COVID, people were dying in the streets because the hospitals had no room and there was no oxygen. Uh, the Philippines has been racked by it. India, multitudes have died. Over uh, 2,000 people have now been declared dead in the Haiti earthquake. And over, I think it is uh, 
10, 15,000 have been uh, seriously injured in that earthquake. And, and then you look at just the devastation of Afghanistan, the Taliban taking over. We can absolutely become so disheartened and hopeless in the middle of it. And that's what the enemy wants. He wants us to have a poverty of spirit, of soul. If our spirit, if our soul, if our emotions are out of control negatively, we don't have the will to get up and do what we should do. And then who cares about the intellect or if the intellect rules and our spirit doesn't rule, we can be out of balance and not be whole. But God wants us to prosper. And it says that when, when, when we're, we're moving from faith to faith, we need faith in the middle of this devastation. It says that we move from strength to strength. What brings strength? The word's real clear. It says a merry heart does good like medicine. It heals us. Nehemiah 8.10 says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so joy is a valuable commodity. You cannot separate joy from prospering. If I am prospering if my, in my soul, if I'm prospering in my spirit, I am filled with joy. This morning I got up uh, just... Uh, filled, aware, inundated by all the negatives in the world today. But I began to worship. As I worshiped, I said, God, I cannot have a poverty of spirit and really pray rightly and know how to move forward in a spirit of faith James said that faith without works is dead. So we need faith as well as works linked to it. So I can't move forth with faith, with doing the right things, taking the right actions, with a spirit of joy, because the glory of the Lord is breaking out, because it says thirdly that we go from glory to glory. So we are growing in our ability to prosper in faith, in, in strength, and in glory, that these things are exponential. I think about, and, and generosity releases a, a spirit of joy. Generosity releases a spirit of gratefulness. Generosity releases finances. Malachi 3, all you have to do is read that, read Malachi 3. Malachi 3 opens up, it says it opens the windows of heaven, so it opens up strategies. Generosity, giving of our, of, of our tithes and of our offerings, a spirit of generosity, giving alms. What was it that opened the windows of heaven for Cornelius? It was not only praying, but it was giving alms to the poor. Generosity. Because I'm blessed, I can, uh, I can tip people better than I could years ago. And I, I remember it's not the amount you give, it's, it's the amount of percentage of what you have. For instance, for me, generosity is a different thing than it was for the widow. The widow gave her might. That's all she had. I remember when I was in college and this friend of mine, she broke her shampoo bottle. That's back when uh, shampoo bottles were glass. And all I had was enough money to buy her a shampoo, a new bottle of shampoo. What did I do? I gave her, I gave her the money to get a new bottle of shampoo. I can't, I can remember to this day how filled with joy I was because I was able to supply her lack. I was able to supply her need, didn't have any money left, but I gave what I had. It was, it was a spirit of generosity. I was not moved by what I didn't have. I was moved by what I had. What do you have to give? Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says, given it shall be given unto you. It doesn't say wait till you get something, but give what you have right now. 
Give, give financially. Give, give love. Give joy. Give whatever, and you'll get more. That's what it's talking about. It, it, there's another passage in Proverbs, if you want friends, then be friendly. And so, so there's a whole principle of breaking the spirit by, of poverty. And the spirit of religion is, is what we need to move away from. Some of you out there are riddled by, am I doing the right thing? Am I praying enough? Am I reading the Bible enough? Listen, just pick a simple goal and do it. And don't look at what other people are doing. Don't look at what somebody says you should do. But do what's in your heart to do. And put it, just spend time with the Lord. Spend what time you have. Start out with that. Do something. Just give what you have. Don't give what people are telling you. The spirit of religion holds a stick over your head and says you'll never measure up. Yes, you will. Because God is crazy about you. A spirit of religion needs to be broken. We need an outbreak of the spirit of a fathering spirit that breaks the orphan spirit that God doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about me. And when we develop a, a, a prosperous spirit, it breaks all three of these. It breaks poverty. It breaks a spirit of infirmity. And it breaks a, uh, a, a, a spirit of religion. Recently, something happened. Uh, I don't have time to give the details. But it was, it was a, a, a crisis in my own life that was of, of a of a magnanimous proportion. And I cannot remember being that scared or terrified ever. I'm sure I was, but, but literally I was struck by, by terror. And for maybe a, a day and a half, maybe two days. And I just, what did I do? And I'm, I was thinking about the nations of the earth, the people of the earth. What did I do? I put on worship music. I worship 24 hours a day. I went to sleep with worship music on. I, I, I worship and I just held up my hands in the, even in spite of the terror. And all of a sudden, God broke through. What was the issue? The issue was basically, did I trust God or not? It was a, the issue was a place of surrender, of trusting God with my life, of trusting God with my future, of trusting that God cared, of trusting that he was a good God. When that broke, what else happened? Joy broke forth. A prosperous spirit broke forth. A spirit of poverty, infirmity, a spirit of religion literally were broken because I surrendered to the fact that I have a father who is crazy about me, who loves me more than anything in the world. He loves you. He's crazy about you. And he is for you. And he will help you break in to a prosperous spirit breaking poverty, breaking infirmity, and breaking religion. Wow, I love this. Breaking the chokehold of poverty. Thank you so much for tuning in to Breaking the Chokehold of Poverty. We pray that you have been blessed, inspired, and strengthened in God, that nothing is impossible with Him. Please keep in touch with us about future conferences, events, webinars like this, and other strategic resources for your life in Christ. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel. Also remember, consider sowing a seed to partner with this important event that we were able to offer for free as a resource for your life. And we'll see you next time. God bless you.